Over Guadalcanal, an F4F Wildcat screams by in a dire situation. With three zeros on your tail and tracers flying by the cockpit, you are at the controls, faced with the decisions that will either keep you alive or end your life. Let's follow this actual mission from 1942 and dive into the combat reports and most importantly, see if you can survive. Now, while we all know that a dogfight can be tough to survive, something that can feel even more stressful is dealing with debt. If you don't believe me, just ask famous Marine fighter ace Gregory Pappy Boyington. Straight from his personal file here, we can see this, a 1941 memo from a tea company stating that Pappy owed a debt of $300, or a few thousand dollars today. And unfortunately, Pappy did not have this video's sponsor, PDS Debt. PDS Debt is your wingman in the battle against debt. They are here to help you take on the struggle of credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills by consolidating them all into one low monthly payment that allows you to manage the fight. And since PDS Debt is a top-rated company on Google and has an a rating with the Better Business Bureau, you can rest assured that you are in good hands. So if you are in a fight against debt, take advantage of what Pappy Boynton wished that he had. Head over to pdsdebt.com, take 30 seconds, and get your free debt assessment today. Remember, you're not in it alone. Fight back and take control with PDS Debt. Now, back to the Pacific to see if you can survive. It is October of 1942, and currently, the Battle for Guadalcanal is the focus of the war in the Pacific. The Japanese are fighting tooth and nail to defend this island and the Americans are paying a price for every foot of ground that they take. The only thing giving the Allied forces any hope of victory is their air power, protecting the forces on the island and bombarding defending positions across the front lines. And this is where you will join the fight. You are a well-trained marine aviator by the name of Captain Joe Foss, a pilot in a brand new unit, Marine Fighting Squadron 121. But your journey to this point was far from typical. At 27 years of age, you are far older than any of the other pilots in your position. But after persisting requests to be assigned to a combat unit, you were eventually transferred here. And now we'll get your first opportunity to join the fight as an officer in VMF 121. Your aircraft here is the storied F4F Wildcat. Certainly not a cutting edge brand new fighter, but the F-4F is a reliable and proven aircraft. Here, on your way to the Pacific Theater, you are all too aware that your primary adversary will be the Japanese Zero, which now, in the fall of 1942, is debatably the most feared aircraft in the war. Right now, back in the United States, the Americans were currently testing a captured Zero to discover its secrets, but that information would not be made common for a few more months. So, for the time being, the A6M0 was still a feared adversary and flown by well-trained pilots. But this is war and you must do your duty. So, as long as you can make wise decisions, you should be able to survive. On October 10th of 1942, your new VMF-121 landed their Wildcats on Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, replacing a beleaguered group of veterans who had been fighting there. Your new home here would be a recently captured airstrip that was a priceless asset in the war in the Pacific. Its name would be Henderson Field. Guadalcanal Airport, the tiny patch of land for which Japan has sacrificed a fleet of warships and thousands of fighting men, still bristles with United States bombers. For the forces that control Guadalcanal command the approaches to Australia, Full mastery of the skies over the vitally important Solomon Islands. Just three days after arriving on this contested airfield, your baptism by fire would arrive, and it would be one to remember. On the morning of October 13th, all would be normal, but then, just before lunchtime, your squadron would be scrambled, as a Japanese raid had been reported, headed towards Guadalcanal. At approximately 1100 hours, Major Dobbin, Captain Irwin, and Second Lieutenants Hartley, Brooks, Stout, Walter, and Mann took off to combat an enemy raiding force, a 
of 24 twin-engine bombers and approximately 24 Zero-type fighter aircraft. In this engagement, 2nd Lieutenant Mann destroyed a Zero and Lieutenant Freeman a VMF-121, a bomber. Now, if you notice, Captain Joe Foss is not mentioned here. This is because you were not scrambled for this initial mission. You were, in fact, assigned to remain at Henderson, on alert if any other Japanese targets were reported, ready to defend the newly captured airfield. After all, seeing that we had just taken this airbase a few days prior, the Japanese were no doubt hungry to get it back. A few hours later, in the mid-afternoon, this would be proven all too accurate. The Japanese were aggressively trying to counterattack Henderson Field with all the air power that they could muster. At 1530 hours, the enemy again attacked via air, his force consisting of 15 twin-engine bombers and 10 Zero fighters. Their target was Henderson Field. For this raid, VMF-121 was once again scrambled, and now it would be you assigned to lead the flight to intercept the incoming force. This is your very first combat mission. As you head to your Wildcat, you are anxious and excited. This is what you have been waiting for. After a year of training and another year of waiting, finally you are here, starting up and taking off to meet the enemy. But combat is rarely what men think it will be, and your first taste would be no different. As the Wildcats taxi and head to the runway, they are off with you, Captain Joe Foss, as the leader, putting Henderson Field behind in the distance. But as you are about to begin grouping up, you realize there is a problem. With the newly captured Henderson Field still being organized and VMF-121 being the new unit on base, cohesiveness and order are still being perfected. The other Marine Squadron, VMF-223, has been delayed slightly in their takeoff and it looks like it might be a minute or two before they are up. And now you are faced with your first decision of your combat career, not even a minute into your first mission. With the other squadron slightly delayed, do you A. Circle once more over the airfield, allowing them time to take off and form up with you. B. Head to the target as directed, but at a slower speed so that they can form up. Or C. Head to the target as directed at full speed, so that you can be in the ideal position to intercept. The enemy is quickly approaching, so decide fast. Although an organized and by-the-book formation would be ideal for a raid on a ground target, for the purposes of a scrambled intercept, time and altitude are the most critical factors. The Royal Air Force had just found this out a couple of years prior in the Battle of Britain, where time to get into the air was the highest priority for fighter command, as it allowed the British defenders to gain the most altitude possible, putting them in the best position to attack incoming raids. The same is also true here in the Pacific. If you wait for VMF-223 to take off and form up, that could mean another two or 3,000 feet that you are not able to gain before meeting the raid, which could be the difference between life and death. So this means that the correct answer is C, to form up and head to the reported target location at full speed, gaining as much height as possible before making contact with the enemy. Hopefully, you chose correctly and are now over the Pacific. A few minutes later, you are at about 10,000 feet and scanning the skies. You are in formation with your fellow Wildcats and your hands are no doubt nervous, waiting for the crucial moment. Then it comes. The silence is broken as your wingman calls out. Bandits, 10 o'clock low. There they are, G4M Bettys, just as reported. Based on their heading, they are clearly headed for Henderson Field, your home airstrip and current location of many of your squadron mates, who have likely just returned from the earlier raid that day. The Betty Bombers are in an ideal position to attack right now, but there is a problem. Where are the escorts? In the original report, there were 10 zeros listed as escorting this raid, but now they are nowhere to be seen. Was this an incorrect report, or did the Zeros turn off and attack another target? There is no way to be sure, and this brings us to our next decision. 
with the Betty sighted and only three or four minutes from dropping their payload on Henderson Field. What do you do? A, dive in and attack the Bettys now, striking them before they hit Henderson. B, wait a few minutes for VMF-223 to arrive and attack together after the bombers hit Henderson. Or C, patrol the area, scanning for the escorting zeros, leaving the bomber flight alone. Time is ticking, so decide. This one is no doubt a difficult decision, but the key detail is the time to target for the Japanese raid. If we were still out farther over the Pacific, we might be able to do a little more scanning for the escorting zeros, or even wait for friendlies to arrive. This decision is not ideal without locating the zeros, but since the large raid will soon be over Henderson in just a few moments, there is only one decision that works. Choice A, to attack now and protect your home airfield with its valuable personnel, supplies, and aircraft below. So you do just this and roll over, beginning your first aerial combat of your career. You barrel downwards on the flight of Betty's, opening fire as you tear through the flight. It was a good attacking run, and you likely landed a couple of hits, but nothing fatal. So you pull up and start a climbing turn, preparing for another pass on the flight as they continue towards Guadalcanal. And this is the moment where you realize the crucial mistake that you have made. As an inexperienced pilot, you failed to locate the escorting zeros, which had set up a textbook trap. The Japanese fighters were above and behind, hiding in the clouds and waiting to pounce. And now that you have given your altitude to attack the bombers, you are right where the enemy wanted you. The Zeros dive down and begin opening fire on your Wildcat. Here, Captain Joe Foss is in quite a predicament, and it's going to take some wise decision making to get you out of this one. But the choice must be made, and lead is flying overhead. Now with the Zero barreling downwards from behind, and opening fire on your climbing Wildcat, what do you do? Do you A. Try to turn away, hoping to beat him in a maneuvering fight. B. Punch the throttle forwards, hoping to gain speed and outrun him. Or C. Lower your flaps, hoping to lose speed and cause the Zero to overshoot. Tracers are flying, so choose. The correct answer here comes down to knowing your opponent and his aircraft. First, turning might remove you from harm's way for a moment, but when the Zero begins his turn, he will quickly end up back in a firing position. And likewise, pushing the throttle forward might normally work on a level playing field, but since the Zero is currently in a dive, he has the airspeed advantage, and you won't be able to outrun him. This leaves the correct choice as C, lowering your flaps, hoping to slow down and cause the speeding Japanese fighter to overshoot his target. So as his adversary bears down, Captain Foss lowers the flaps, and just like he planned, the Zero does fly by, overshooting the Marine Wildcat. As he soars past your cockpit, the advantage is now yours. You raise the flaps and push forward on the throttle, and just like that, you are now the attacker. You push forward, engine open, and place the Zero in your sights. Once you are close enough to see the meatballs on his wings, you open fire. Your machine guns explode to life and tracers find their target. The Zero quickly catches fire and rolls over, going down into the jungles of Guadalcanal, your first confirmed kill. But in the excitement, you realize this might also be your last confirmed kill. Right as the Zero explodes on the ground below, you jump back to reality, and once again, more tracers fly over your cockpit, and you see that not one, but three more Zeros have jumped onto your tail. This brings you to another decision. At low altitude, with three more Zeros now on your tail, what do you do? A. Try to climb, hoping that the Zeros leave you and pursue another target. B. Head straight to Henderson Field at full speed, hoping to lead the Zeros to anti-aircraft batteries. C. Bail out, it might be your only chance at survival. 
time is short, so decide as quickly as possible. For this choice, climbing will likely leave you dead, as it will slow you down and make you an easy target. That strategy might work in a Hellcat, but the Wildcat's engines simply won't leave three zeros in the dust fast enough. And bailing out, while it might be survivable, is not recommended. You are at a low altitude already, and in addition, tracers are flying all around you, and you could be easily struck by one of them leaving the plane. This means that option B, trying to lead the zeros over Henderson Field, is the best possible option. But unfortunately for Captain Joe Foss, even this plan wouldn't work. After turning to head to Henderson, his F4F simply couldn't get there fast enough. The Zeros were already in a firing position, and this fire was accurate. In moments, his F4F Wildcat took a beating, absorbing a number of hits from the pursuing aircraft. Immediately, your fighter shakes, and you see smoke pouring from your engine. The aircraft jolts you forward, and you can feel thrust coming to a halt. Quickly, you assess your situation. The only good news, perhaps, is that the Japanese fighters have appeared to pull off, leaving you for dead and moving to their next target. But beyond that, there is nothing good to see. Your Wildcat is battered and you have multiple leaks, losing fluids across the board. In addition, you quickly realize that your engine is out, providing no power and leading you to a glide. In this predicament, we have another decision, this one life or death. With no engine and losing multiple fluids at less than 500 feet of altitude, what do you do? A. Attempt to land at Henderson Field, which is now fairly close. B. Try a risky bailout at 500 feet. Or C. Attempt to restart the engine. You are losing altitude every second, so make your choice. As your Wildcat limps through the air, this final decision is likely the most critical to your survival. The simple fact is that at 500 feet of altitude, you are far too low to bail out, not allowing your chute enough time to fully deploy. Furthermore, you lack the time to try and restart your engine, because you likely have less than a minute of time remaining before you lose airspeed and stall. Thus, your only option is A, a do-or-die attempt to land at Henderson Field, which is currently under attack, making things even more difficult. So Captain Joe Foss, after being badly hit by three zeros, points his nose at Henderson Field and begins an approach. As he holds the stick with one hand and hand pumps his landing gear down with the other, he realizes that he has lost all hydraulics, meaning that he will have no flaps and no brakes. This landing is bound to be one to remember. As you approach the runway, nearly missing a group of trees, you miraculously touch down with moderate control, keeping the F4F straight and on the runway. Fortunately, the airstrip is long and you are able to slow down without brakes before rolling into the trees. With the Wildcat eventually coming to a stop, you look your aircraft over, with smoke pouring out and bullet holes all over. You have done it, surviving your first combat mission and scoring a confirmed kill, despite being torn apart by Japanese fighters. It was a valuable lesson and a tough welcome to the war, but you are here. And now you have one final decision. What would you like your celebratory meal to be at the Henderson Field Mess Hall? A. Sliced Spam B. A Spam Sandwich Or C. Bread with a Side of Spam After this celebratory meal and a brutal first mission, Captain Joe Foss would go on to become one of the most storied marine pilots of World War II, scoring 26 kills in the Pacific and being awarded the Medal of Honor. Comment below how you scored and consider joining my Patreon so I can make more videos like this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.